We are in the book of Isaiah. The introduction to the book is six chapters long, and that's all we're doing in this series. And we are in the sixth chapter today of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. And we're, we frame this as being in the king's court. And uh, in the king's court, uh, we come today uh, to the uh, heavenly call in the king's court. In fact, the text says, in the year that King Uzziah died. And uh, I've got the gravestone there. They actually have a gravestone. And that is the gravestone from uh, Uzziah, the king who died. And that we know exactly what year it was. It was 739 B.C. So 700, let's say 740 years before Christ, Isaiah uh, has a commission from God, a call from God. And I call it in the king's court because in the text we're going to find <clears throat> that he was in the temple. And so if he's in the temple, it's got an outer court. He's in the king's court. Remember that the temple is uh, inside of it had the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, several places in the Bible, it calls it the throne of God. And so God would manifest himself there in a Shekinah glory cloud. And, and he would be in his, in his, uh, as king in the midst of the nation Israel. And Isaiah it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Whoa. I saw the Lord. Now, I got this question for you. In fact, I'm going to have four questions this morning. But the first one is this. Have you seen the King of Glory? You see, Isaiah did. In the year 739 B.C., in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord. But John tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 41 Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. <clears throat> wow. 740 years before Christ, Isaiah saw the Lord. That's what he said. I saw the Lord and he's sitting on his throne. It says, seated on a throne. He was high, exalted. He's lifted up. He's enthroned. And it says, and the train of his robe. Now, when you think of a train, I usually think of a locomotion, you know, a locomotive train. Uh, but there's a train that follows the bride. You ever notice that? She's got this long, flowing white dress. And, and, it, and, and then when I have a, a wedding, I, I have to tell the person when there's a long, flowing one, the bridesmaid, now you've got to make sure you, you always spread that thing out and make it look really nice, okay? This case, the robe of the king of glory, he, he's in his royal robe, and, and it says, his, his train filled the whole temple. It's like no room. He, he, <clears throat> the whole idea here is, he is the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And Isaiah says, I saw him. Whew. I saw him. The second thing I noticed, it says, he saw his glorious seraphs. Now, those seraphs are only mentioned in one place in the Bible right here. The word seraph is a, a burning. <clears throat> it's also used for snakes. You know, if you get a snake bite, it'll burn. <laughs> and so they're the burning ones. <clears throat> Some believe that they were actually a, a, a rank of the cherubs. And remember in, in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden? There were cherubs placed there with flaming swords so that they would keep out Adam and Eve from going back and eating the tree of life that they might live forever confirmed in their sins. These are the, the, the seraphs are the burning ones, and I don't know what they really look like other than this description right here, but I thought this artist really captured it. His whole body's like glowing and burning. Each of them had a, a six wings. And then I says they're seraphs, so there's more than one. Each had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. Now, this artist's picture, he doesn't have me have just all six wings flying, but he, two, they covered their faces. As if God is so holy that even they cannot look upon Him in all the glory of His holiness. With two, it says, they covered their feet almost in shame to show their nakedness. With two, they were flying. Obviously, Isaiah in this vision of the Lord, high, exalted, lifted up, Jesus in all of His glory with His angels attending unto Him. 
He, he sees and he hears them calling one to another, holy, holy, holy. Whew. If you've ever jumped to the end of the Bible, there's these four living creatures. I call them, since there's cherubim and then there's seraphim, I call them thingabims. Because it said they're living things, so I call them thingabims. <clears throat> and what are they doing? They're crying, holy, holy, holy. Holiness is the number one attribute of God. Theologians will tell you that. Above all else, God is holy. Which means he is set apart and different and unique from everything else. Of all the cherubim, seraphim, angels, demons, you name it. Satan himself, mankind, everything that's ever been made. He is uniquely different and above because he is eternal, he's infinite, he's omnipresent, he, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. He is uniquely different. He is set apart from everything else. He is infinite. We are finite. <clears throat> I get eternal life, but my eternal life had a finite beginning and goes on forever. He is infinite because he has no beginning nor no end. He goes on forever and ever both directions. Whew. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The word Almighty is the word of hosts. The Lord of all the heavenly armies. And Isaiah is having this encounter with the Lord. Something unusual happened on that Sunday when he went to church. Of course, it was a, probably a Saturday, and he, it was the Sabbath day, and, and he went to the temple. He had an encounter with God, and he saw him in all of his glory. He says, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Whew. The majesty glory. You see, the word glory just means heavy. We used to have an expression, you know, I don't know, beat Nick used to say, man, that's heavy. That's heavy. It's weighty. It's massive. And what he's saying, the word glory is just saying here, the Hebrew word kaveh, that's saying, God is heavy, buddy. I mean, he's really heavy. God is majestic, awesome. This is powerful. He says, God Almighty, the, the whole earth is full of the majesty of God. Isaiah just seeing the Lord, he, this, is, this is what he's seeing, and this is what's being prompted even by, by the heavenly host and the seraphs. All of a sudden, he saw the Lord's glorious power. At the sound of their voices, the seraphim, the doorpost of the threshold shook. The temple was shaking. Now, I think he's in the outer court. He's not in the temple because he's not a priest. He's only a prophet. And he says, oh, the whole place was shaking. There's an earthquake going on in the time of, uh, of Uzziah at that time. In the vision that he's having of the Lord high and lifted up, he says, the place is shaking and the temple was filled with smoke. If you go back to 1 Kings chapter 5, I believe it's there, that Solomon dedicated the temple. And when he dedicated the temple, God came down on the temple and filled the temple with smoke. The smoke was so great that the priests could not even stay in there. They had to get out because God came down on that place. And he said here, God in all of his power is manifest in this vision that Isaiah has when he saw the Lord in all of his glory. I have to ask you, have you seen the Lord in his glory? Have you seen? I mean, obviously Isaiah did. It was in the year that King Uzziah died. But have you seen his glory? The disciples saw his glory. It's recorded in John chapter 1. The Word became flesh. Notice the word, Word is capitalized. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a name of Jesus before he was born as a baby Jesus. He was the second person of the eternal trinity. And Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord Jesus. And he's saying here, in that glory, okay, the Word became flesh, he says, and he dwelt among us. He inhabited a body, and we have seen his glory. There it is. The disciples saw the glory of the Lord. The glory of the only, the one and only, the only begotten Son of God, the one and only, His only begotten, 
who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The disciples saw him. In fact, the first time they actually saw him, there it tells us that he came, but the first time it tells us that they, they saw his glory is in John chapter 2. Jesus was at the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. And while he was there, they ran out of wine. And Jesus said there were six stone pots. And he said, hey, take some water and fill those pots. They filled the pots. And then they went and they served. The, and as they served what came out of that water pot, it was wine. And they said, this is the best of all. And Jesus performed his first miraculous sign, it tells us. He performed it at Cain of Galilee, and thus he revealed his glory. There's like a dozen more times in the Gospel of John where they're going to say they saw the glory of Jesus. They saw his glory. They saw his glory. I saw his glory too. I saw his glory too. It wasn't in a vision like Isaiah saw it. It wasn't in the incarnation like, like the disciples saw it. It was in the written Word of God where the Word of God was preached and proclaimed. And, and as I did just as Jesus said to Mary and Martha. Jesus said, did not I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? When you believe, something glorious takes place. Place. As in the case of their brother, he was raised from the dead and they saw the glory of God. You know, when I believe something great happened, a resurrection. Because I was born in my trespasses and sin, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. But when I believed in Jesus, he quickened me and made me alive. I was resurrected spiritually with life. I too have seen his glory. In the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know who he is. He is Jesus, the King of glory. I got a second question that comes from Isaiah. My second question is this. The first one is, have you, have you seen the King's glory? Have you had that encounter with Jesus? Second one is, have you received the King's forgiveness? The King's forgiveness. Isaiah saw Jesus in all of his glory, you see, and, 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 but he also received his forgiveness. Here's how it went down. He knew that he was doomed having seen Jesus in all of his glory. A couple places in the scriptures, no man has ever seen God. And the thinking was, if you were to see God, going all the way back to Moses' this time, you would die. He's too holy for you to handle. All you see is a shadow of him. You don't see him in all of his glory. Why? Whoa, he says, I say, whoa. Whoa to me, I cried. I am ruined. I'm doomed. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. This is, this is a metaphor that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and my heart is corrupt. I'm guilty before God. He knew that he was guilty. I'm convinced that everybody who comes to Jesus and they see Jesus in his glory, they realize they are doomed without him. I am guilty of having sinned against God Almighty and the wages of my sin is death. I am doomed. I am doomed. Gideon, when he realized that he saw the angel of the Lord, thought that he was doomed to, I am a dead man. Manoah, when he saw the glory of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, he too thought he was a dead man. When you realize that I am standing before the thrice holy God, holy, 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 and you realize that I am a sinner and I am a doomed person, it's the natural consequences of seeing the glory of the Lord. He knew he was doomed. He also knew he was helpless. He knew there wasn't a thing he could do. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah will say later in the book. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, 
which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. So he flew to the altar, he took the tongs that go with the altar, he reached down through the grate on it, and he took a live and burning coal, and he placed it in his hand, and his hand is burning live coal. I don't know if you've ever touched a hot coal. I was probably about six years old. If you touch one, you'll remember it. We were at a cookout, family picnic. And the coal had fallen out of, you know, the, the stand at the head. You put the, the, the charcoal in it and you laid it. And one of it had fallen out and it wasn't on fire. It was just white. Well, I thought I would just pick that up and put it right back in. Well, it never got back in because I never even got it off the ground. But my hand was all blistered. This seraph, who's a burning one, that's what a seraph means, he reaches after he takes it out with a tong, he puts it in his hand, and he takes that live and burning coal, and he flies over to Isaiah, and he knew he was touched, because it says, with it, he touched my mouth. Boom, he took that live burning coal, and he touched his mouth. See, this has touched your lips. Watch what it says. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Whoa. There's something that happens when God touches your life and takes away your sins. You become a totally new and different person. You don't even have to try to change he changes you from the inside out. He puts a want to in there that you never had before. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. You now have a new desire. When people tell me they're a Christian but they don't need church, I say they were never truly touched. Because it's not that you don't need it, you want it. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. You want to be a part of it. You, if the want to is in there. He has changed you. When a person is, is a Christian and they don't change their lifestyle, it's not because they have to. When you're changed, you've been touched by God, you want to. You want those things to go. They just disappear. You don't have to lose your friends. They will lose you because those old friends don't want what you've got. You've been touched by God. Isaiah was touched and he knew he was touched. But there's something about this. His guilt was taken away and his sin was atoned for. There's something about that coal that touched his mouth. You see, the angel had taken the tongs and pulled the coal out. That coal was on underneath where they had offered the sacrifice. And when they had slain the sacrifice... Did you ever take a nice red steak and throw it on the grill? And all of a sudden you see, and, and, then, and they ask you, how would you like it? And would you like it well done? You want it medium? You want it rare? You want it, how, how do you want it? And, and, and you know what? What they're going to do is they're going to cook it long enough to get all the blood out. And where's all that blood going when you're cooking it? It's dropping down onto the coal. They offered up this animal sacrifice. The blood of that sacrifice's meat was dripping down on those coals. And the angel took those bloody coals and he purged his mouth of Isaiah. And he says, You're the blood of, the Bible tells us, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. When he applied that burning blood, because that burning blood burned away the iniquity, the guilt with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's what happens. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sins. And so when Jesus touched me as an eight-year-old boy, he purged my sin. My sin was gone. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansed me from all sins. Have you received his forgiveness? That's the question. Isaiah did, but have you? You know, the disciples did because they're the ones that told us in the book of Acts. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. The moment I believe in Christ, I receive the forgiveness. My chains to sin are gone. They're broken. I, I no longer have that. I've been released. I am forgiven of my sin and its consequences. 
I did too receive the Lord Jesus Christ and, and his forgiveness of sins. I've told you my story so many times, but I'm going to repeat it again because I want you to know it as well as I know it. I was at a campfire that I just had up there at a camp in western Michigan and the preacher was preaching and he gave an invitation at the end of his little preaching sermon to us boys. We were all 8 to 12 year olds and it was junior camp and I responded and went down by that campfire. He opened up the Bible of John 3, 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he inserted my name throughout that verse. For God so loved Dennis that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that if Dennis would believe in him, that Dennis should not perish, but Dennis should have eternal life. And he asked me if I wanted to pray and ask Jesus to save me, and I said, I do, and I did. And there at camp, the next day, I went to the camp bookstore and I bought this postcard. That's the actual postcard. Well, it's a picture of the actual postcard. Let's get too technical here. But... This is a picture of it. And I also bought a New Testament. And I wrote on both of them. On the New Testament, I wrote when I, I got saved yesterday. And I put that was the day I got saved. But on the postcard, I wrote to my mom, Mom, yesterday I took guns and I got 17 points. I'll write a letter later this week. Yesterday I got, there's the key word, staved. I didn't know how to spell it. That was only third grade. Not saved, staved. My mom knew exactly what it was, and my mom was rejoicing. She saved that, gave it to me, after, I think about the time I got ordained. She saved that postcard for me. I knew that day God had done something in my life, and I wanted to tell about it. I got staved. Little did I know that I was theologically correct. I did get staved. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Wait, I have been crucified with Christ. The word Crucified means you're nailed to staves. Staves are just boards. That's what the word stave means. I got staved. I got nailed to the cross. He took my place. He was my substitute. So I got staved. And I'm sticking to it. Jesus took away my sin. He purged me. I received it. He cleansed me. I have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. The third question that's being asked in the book of Isaiah chapter 6 is this. Have you accepted the king's mission? Have you accepted the king's mission? Isaiah did. In fact, that's what we're going to see here. Isaiah said, he then heard a call from God. He heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Kind of like the song we sang earlier today. Who shall I send and who will go for us? You see, he's seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in all this glory. And he, he, he's, he, he's been cleansed. He's, he's been saved. He, he, his, his sins have been atoned for and taken away. And he's standing there and the Lord says, Whom shall I stand and go for us? He's got a changed person. And well, how does he respond? He says, Here, here I am. Send me. I'll do it. I'm yours. I'll do it. He responds. He responds. I've seen uh, people at invitation times in the old days. And uh, preacher give an invitation, a person being under conviction so much that God is moving in their heart and they're fighting it so much. They grip the pew in front of them and their knuckles turn white. The knuckles turn white. I hear him calling, but I don't want to go. Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. I'm the guy. And then he was commissioned. And the Lord said, go and tell this people. Whew. That's it? That's all I got to do? Go tell? Yeah, you just go tell your story. Just, just tell them. In fact, here, I'll, I'll give you the words to say, Isaiah. He says, be ever hearing, tell him, be ever hearing and never understanding. Be ever seeing, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. If you're not going to receive, receive the message from me, he's saying, then psh, be a deaf person. Be a blind person. He goes on and he says, make the heart of this people calloused, hard. 
make their ears dull and close their eyes. If they won't believe, your message is going to work just the opposite. Otherwise, if they do believe, they will see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. His commission is kind of like the Apostle Paul, the way he saw it. God told him uh, that he had a ministry for him. He called him to a ministry. And he's telling the Corinthians, for we are God's aroma. So I put a little perfume up there. (laughs) We, We Christians are God's aroma among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. There is a fragrance that goes off of every one of us everywhere I go as a Christian. There is a fragrance of the gospel that goes off of me. And when I speak the gospel, man, it is just oozing out like crazy. The gospel message, it's just perfuming. And some people, it says, to the one, it is the smell of death. Because they reject it. They're doomed. They're doomed. And to the other, it is the fragrance of life. Because they receive it. (laughs) the Apostle Paul says, oh my goodness, who is equal to such a task? That's your task, that's my task, that's Isaiah's task. Do you realize that we are the only gospel some people will ever read? Paul later in that passage says, we're living epistles. We are read of all men. People are reading your life. And they are reading your words. And if your words and your life don't match, you are a savor of death because they'll never believe. But if my words and my life match, I'm a savor to those of life. I mean, it's it's this aroma, this perfume that, that brings life because they receive the good news of Jesus and are saved too. He's being commissioned, not just for surface, to help people, to save people. Not by his own power, the Lord Jesus, using him. Because he said, here I am, send me. He was commissioned, sent with a mission, with the authority of the living God. So my question is, have you accepted the the, the king's mission? Isaiah did. We're going to see that in the next verse and in the following chapters of this book. We'll see. You just read the following chapters. Isaiah, when he said, here I am, send me, he did. He went. He, he, he was the, the spokesperson for God. The disciples also did this. You see, the, the, we, <clears throat> we are a church, a Jesus-built church, built upon the, the, the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the great commandment to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, and the great commission. In Matthew 28, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That's why we sent the goods. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. He gave that to the disciples, and it's been passed on to every disciple ever since. If you're a follower of Jesus, this, this is your mission. This is your purpose, to tell other people about Jesus. They did it. By the time the Apostle Paul writes Colossians 1.6, it says, all over the world, this gospel is uh, is bearing fruit and growing. The gospel had penetrated the Roman Empire in the time of the Apostle Paul. It started out with just 12. Imagine what it could do to Waterford if all of us here today took it up as seriously as the disciples did for Jesus. If we did Jesus talk, I shared my faith with a man over 30 years ago. His name is Russell. And two weeks ago, well, not quite two weeks ago, was his spiritual birthday, the day he accepted Christ in my office. That man has more joy in the Lord than anybody I've ever met. He is as on fire today as he was back then. He's a layman. He was a grinder for General Motors. He said, I used to keep my nose to the grindstone every day. <laughs> then God got his heart. He, he, he started a little ministry in a nursing home. He's been doing it for the last 30 years. 
He goes and he rounds up every single person that will come. He goes down to the room. He gets them, pulls them down. He's got a, caf- a group in a cafeteria there, and then he, he preaches his heart out. I, I like to say he just talks, but no, he, he preaches his heart out. He started a ministry at church, a prayer ministry. I call it prayer evangelism. He sets a, a little uh, billboard, uh, uh, you know, the, the sandwich board out front, and it says, drive in prayer today. And people come and they drive in and he's sitting there in his car waiting for somebody to pray, and he's got a sign on his car, this is where you stop. And he just asks them their request and he says, I'll pray for it right on the spot. And he prays for it. 300 people this summer stop for prayer. You think he's touching people's lives? Holy smoke. The disciples were penetrating the world and we need to penetrate Waterford. Now, not everybody's going to set up a, a sandwich board and be a prayer warrior in a parking lot, but everybody has got to tell someone the message of the good news backed up by a life so they want what you got. And for some, it's going to be savor of life. They're going to accept Christ. He told me one man, or maybe it was a woman, actually right in the car while he was doing the prayer with them, They prayed and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior right there in the parking lot. Is that amazing? Everybody can do something. That's the mission. The goods accepted that call to that mission. They're doing it on our behalf. I did too. When I I was ordained, I was like, I'm I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm a minister of the gospel. It is my business to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But guess what? You don't have to be ordained to have the mission. Being saved is what gave you the mission. It's your job to share the good news. So won't you do it too? Won't you do it too? I know what some of you are thinking, I don't know how to do this. I just don't know how to share it. Well, we're going to help you. This is my commercial. Time out of the sermon, my commercial. Uh, Next week is the second, and then on the ninth, we're going to do a Bible study, adult Bible study, after the service. It's called More to Life, because there's more to life than just every day. And we're going to talk about saving body, mind, and soul. It's a study on that. Don Hinkson's going to help me. He's going to do the body and the mind. He's going to uh, do some teaching, latest uh, teaching, uh, uh, current, uh, currently available, uh, how to tell the t- signs of a person who's troubled and might harm themselves or someone else, and how to work with them in their body and mind to direct them in a new path so no one gets hurt. Whew. And then we're going to follow that up with how to help people on their soul. What, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? We're going to show you how to tell your own story weaving the gospel into it so it's just very natural. Stay with us for those four Sundays. Also, we're feeding you. Pizza and pop. All right. Pizza and pop. Right after the service, pizza and pop, and then we're going to do our, our study. I guarantee you, it will give you a tool for you to just naturally, casually share your faith so that you can accept the mission too. You could accept the mission too. The final question that he asks, he says, have you committed to the king's service? Have you made a commitment to serve him? Isaiah did. Isaiah said, for how long, O Lord? How long? How long am I supposed to do this mission that you've given me? That's a good question. How long? And so Isaiah is asking this question, how long? And here's the answer. Until the cities lie ruined without inhabitant. You know what he's saying? Until there's nobody else to talk to. (laughs) When there's nobody else, your, your commission's over. Until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, there's nobody around. Until the Lord has sent everyone far away. You see, they're going to go into captivity. And everyone is utterly forsaken. You've got this job to do until there's nobody to do it with. You just preach the word. That's what you've got to do. You share the faith. He says, and though a tenth remains. He says, oh, there's going to be a tenth of the people remain in the land. The rest are going to be carried away. 
He said, it will again <clears throat> be laid waste a second time. As the, the terebinth and, and the oak leave a stump when they are cut down, the nation of Israel is going to be cut down, carried away into captivity. But he said, there's going to be a holy seed in that stump that's going to grow out of it. And that seed is twofold. That seed is the nation of Israel, and that seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the seed, the coming Messiah. That's the answer. The answer is you do this as long as there are people to share the faith with. If you're to so totally isolated, there's nobody to share the faith with, then I guess you can't do it. But as long as there's somebody in the room, you have opportunity to share your faith. So the question is, have you committed to the king's service? I'm going to tell you, Isaiah did. I Isaiah did. In the apocryphal book of the ascension of Isaiah... It tells of Isaiah's martyrdom as he was sawn in two with a wooden saw. That sounds very painful to me. I think in Hebrews 11, verse 37, in that hall of heroes of the faith, it may be referring to him as it says, they were sawn in two. Why? For their faith. For their faith. Listen, the disciples also did. Every last one of them was martyred for their faith, except for the Apostle John, who was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and he wrote the Revelation, and Judas, who went out and hung himself because he betrayed the Lord of glory. Got a picture here of Peter. Peter says, it's too good for me to be crucified regular way. Flip me upside down, crucify me upside down. I am not worthy to even die the way Jesus died. That is commitment. I will die for my message. And that's what the gospel is all about. Jesus died to give me eternal life. I am willing to give my life back to him. I take up my cross daily and follow him. I want to do that also. Well, it's not that I want to die upside down. I just want to be faithful unto death. Amen? Amen? So I ask you, have you seen the king's glory with the eye of faith? Hmm? Have you seen him? The second question is, have you received the king's forgiveness by confessing him? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you confessed him as Lord? Take away your sins. Have you accepted the mission to go and tell? No, you're meddling a little bit, preacher. <laughs> and will you commit to the king's service? To live for him. Whew. Isaiah, powerful book, amen? Powerful book. Four powerful questions. I trust you have seen him. You've received his forgiveness. You've accepted his mission. And you'll go out now and serve him. And serve him. You can do it today. You don't have to wait till next week. You can do it today. Because there's people all around you. So let's pray. Father, Father in heaven, Isaiah is a powerful book and we've kind of wound down this series and yet there's someone here in their heart saying, you know, I need Jesus as my Savior. Maybe it's someone watching online. I need Jesus, the King of glory. I need His forgiveness. Uh, I need His blood to purge my heart and cleanse me and wash me, make me whiter than snow. I, I, I want to volunteer for the mission. Maybe there's somebody even here saying, uh, Lord, here I am. Use me. And all of us, Lord, we want to be in the service of the King. We want to serve you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we, we want to serve you till the day we die. May the Spirit of God so prompt us in those moments when we should be serving you to choose you over ourselves. Lord, we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen.